Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 28. Today I'll be discussing the next era in the evolutionary history of life, called the Cenozoic Era. I started with the Precambrian, which led into the Paleozoic Era, the Age of Fish. Some of these fish crawled onto land to radiate and evolve in the Mesozoic Era, the Age of Reptiles. If you were just listening to the last episode, you should remember that the Mesozoic Era came to a climactic end with the impact of a huge asteroid 66 million years ago. This impact and the following ash cloud choked the planet and blocked out the sun, killing most of the plants, as well as most dinosaurs, marine creatures, and many other species of land-dwelling animal. The world was left barren and empty, and the ash in the sky kept the world dark and cold. But this period of desolation eventually passed. The ash cleared from the sky, and once again the sun warmed the surface of the earth. This was a new age, an age called the Cenozoic Era. It was a period lasting from 66 million years ago to the present day, and it's currently ongoing as we speak. The Cenozoic Era is split into three parts, called the Paleogene, the Neogene, and the Quaternary Period. During the early Paleogene, at the very beginning of the Cenozoic Era, the world's biota were recovering from the mass extinction. Ecosystems were reforming, and species were undergoing adaptive radiations to fill all the open niches in the new ecosystems. As most of the dinosaurs on land and in the oceans had gone extinct, this made room for the mammals and birds and other groups to come in and fill the void. In the oceans, all the reptilian predators like the giant ichthyosaurs had been wiped out, and predators like sharks and crocodiles stepped up to the plate to become the new apex predators. On land, small mammals like creodonts and the early primates became ubiquitous in many places across the world. All of these creatures were small, as the largest mammals, reptiles, and amphibians were all wiped out in the KT extinction. Plants actually dominated the Earth, taking advantage of the rising heat to expand across the planet. This was especially true in the mid-Paleogene, when global temperatures had risen significantly and allowed the world to become swamped in jungles. By the time the ecosystems of the world had recovered, the surviving species had already radiated and speciated a number of times. While mammals still hadn't gotten much larger than 10 or 15 kilograms, they had begun to diverge into a number of distinct groups. Primates were one of these groups, and they became more varied in the jungles across the world, as were the ungulates, like horses and goats, and the recent ancestors of the whales that began to move back into the oceans. Of all the animal species on the planet at the time, the largest and most fearsome were the birds, the descendants of the dinosaurs who just insisted on keeping their family legacy going for a little bit longer. Various species of birds could be carnivorous and predatory, or they could be omnivorous, or they could be herbivores. The predator birds feasted on the huge selection of tiny reptiles and mammals that was now available to them, plucking rodents off the ground and yanking primates out of the trees. Some birds dove into the water to catch fish, or they merely swooped their claws in as they flew by to grab an unlucky fish that was swimming near the surface. Many species of these birds were enormous, with some like the diatrima or the gastornis standing more than two meters tall. The gastornis was a flightless bird, similar in many respects to the ostriches of today. But unlike modern ostriches, the gastornis had a massively thick beak and a heavy skull, and all of this was mounted on a really thick muscular neck, on legs of thick bone ending in talon-toed feet. They're like the ostrich's larger, meaner, older brother. But despite their ferocious appearance, there's debate over whether or not these birds were actually carnivores. The traditional idea was that these huge birds would have have to have been predatory, no doubt feasting on the numerous small mammals that roamed around. Things like the carnivorous creodonts or the omnivorous primates, all of whom were at the time no more than 10 kilograms, or about 22 pounds, all of these little creatures would have been easy picking for a giant predatory bird. Furthermore, the gastornis skull is designed to provide a hugely powerful bite, which supports the idea that it was a predator, able to break the bones of its prey. Although, others argued that gastornis was an omnivore, or an herbivore, because it lacked a few telltale features of predatory birds. For instance, its beak wasn't hooked. In predatory birds, the beak features a sharp hook at the tip, ideal for ripping flesh, holding onto prey, or attacking a competing predator. But the fossils of the gastornis don't have this hook. Also, its powerful bite could have been used to open seeds just as easily as it could have been used to snap bone. <laughs> 
and with the continent-covering jungles of the time, it isn't too unreasonable to think that there might have been a few tough seeds that the Gastornis cracked open for food. Although that does raise the question, if there was all these jungles and all this food everywhere, why didn't the Gastornis just go for an easier-to-access fruit? Although, to put the issue to rest, recent studies on the calcium isotopes in the Gastornis fossils have found that they almost certainly didn't have meat in their diet, and instead they most likely ate the leaves and shoots of plants, like many of the dinosaur ancestors. Another clade of large birds are the forest rachids, or the terror birds. These things were just as tall, if not taller, than the Gastornis, and they possessed all the hallmarks of an apex predator. First, they had the hooked beak, distinctive of a bird of prey. Their 18-inch beaks were tipped with a downward-curving growth, like a knife, used to slice and rip at prey. Their necks were really flexible and muscular, capable of striking out at incredible speed. Combined with their heavy, bony head and the sharp knife at the end of their beak, the force of a forest rackets lunging out to bite you or stab at you would be tremendous. They would break bone before they even closed their jaws. For most small creatures alive at the time, a forest racket strike would be instant death. They had powerful legs so they could run quickly, but they weren't particularly agile. If you were a small Cenozoic era mammal, you might be able to outrun them if you were agile enough, if you could cut your corners fast enough. But if you weren't, if the forest racket caught you, it would hold you down with a foot sharp with talons, while pecking at your flesh with its razor beak until you bled out or just had your body just totally torn and mangled. The morphology of their beaks suggests that they didn't even try to shake their prey to death. They instead chose to slice and stab with incessant pecking motions. So if you thought the Gastornis sounded a little scary, how about the creatures literally called terror birds? For all the little humble mammals of the era, for all the little critters and primates hiding out in the dense forests and the underbrush, these predator birds were just terror incarnate. But it would be these humble mammals who would later go on to become the dominant land predators. In the Paleogene, the creodonts had spread and adapted to many places in North America, Eurasia, and Africa. And for much of the early Paleogene, the intense heat in the dense, extensive jungle habitat had kept the mammal species pretty small. But in time, all things must come to an end. And as this was true for the dinosaurs, this was also true for the planetary forests of the early Paleogene. The Earth underwent a cooling period as ocean currents began circulating cold water from the poles. This cooling caused the jungles to recede, leaving behind new habitats like grasslands and temperate forests and prairie. The world literally opened up, allowing animals to run and graze across large expanses of open land, land that was previously choked by trees and foliage. As life grows to fit its environment, this literal opening up of the landscape allowed animals to grow larger getting much bigger than their ancestors who had just barely survived the KT extinction event. Mammals went from a bunch of 20-pound tetrapods to become huge beasts, similar in size to modern-day tigers or elephants or whales. Speaking of whales, they had really emerged into their own in the oceans, so much so that by the mid-Paleogene they were competing with sharks to be the top predator in the ocean. Meanwhile, on land, the primates evolved the lineage of apes, and this would go on to split into the great apes, which includes humans, and the lesser apes. There was also the mammalian sarcastodon, a so-called hyper-predator that lived 35 million years ago. These sarcastodon had massive hyena-like skulls, which suggested that they were huge predators who hunted and killed other large mammals. The Sarcastodons most likely hunted the Calicotheres and the Brontotheres, both grazing herbivores that grew to the size of horses. Both of these species were closely related to the ancestors of horses and rhinoceroses, and they shared many similarities with them. The Brontotheres were kind of like rhinoceroses. They had gray skin and horns, and they grazed on the leaves and shoots of plants. By the late Paleogene, the Creodonts began to get outcompeted by the Carnivorans, another lineage of carnivorous mammal. The end of the Paleogene period saw the emergence of numerous species from these lineage of carnivora, including the wolves, bears, hyenas, and the big cats. Other species of mammal emerged as well, including the elephants and marsupials. Many species of mammal came into existence only to go extinct a few million years later, like the Uintotheridae, which looked kind of like a hippopotamus, as well as a possibly related group called the Mesonychia. Some other animals that emerged at the time were the pantodonts and the entelodonts, 
The pantodonts were kind of goofy looking. They, they appeared like weird bears with really long necks and tails, and they were covered in a long fur, kind of like an orangutan. The intelodonts are really fascinating creatures. They existed for about 21 million years during the late Paleogene, and they were basically giant primordial pig monsters, more closely related to whales than pigs, but taking the form of a huge bulky pig. Mature adult intelodonts stood nearly 7 feet at the shoulder, with a body weight that could have possibly exceeded a thousand pounds. They were engines of gluttonous destruction. They would hunt and eat as many animals as they could, and if that didn't satisfy their hunger, they would plow down on plates of leaves, stems, and tubers. These intelodonts were called hell pigs, or terminator pigs, and they were the top predators of their ecosystem. And yet, despite their intimidating size, these things had brains the size of a tennis ball. This is kind of like the dinosaurs of yesteryear, like the Brachiosaurus, with its 30-foot height and its walnut-sized brain. Mammals weren't just the only species to radiate and speciate during the early Paleogene. Snakes, which had originated many millions of years earlier in the late Cretaceous, had survived the KT extinction and were now, in the Paleogene, undergoing successive adaptive radiations. As a result, the snake populations exploded in size and diversity, spreading to almost all the corners of the world. The snakes were particularly adapted to the grasslands and savannas that would become so common during this time period. In these places, the snakes were apex predators because they could slither through the grass unseen, able to sneak up and pounce on various grassland rodents that also thrived in the dry habitat. Remember how back at the beginning of the Paleogene, the warming earth had become covered in dense jungles? It takes CO2 from the air for plants to grow, for these jungles to form. And so during the summer in the northern hemisphere, when most plants on earth are growing, CO2 is absorbed from the air and global CO2 levels drop ever so slightly. In winter, leaves fall and plants decay and the carbon returns to the atmosphere and the global CO2 levels rise ever so slightly. But during the Paleogene, the formation of these huge forests sucked a lot of the CO2 out of the atmosphere. Because CO2 is a greenhouse gas, its mass removal from the atmosphere encouraged the global cooling that defined much of the Paleogene. But understand that this removal of CO2 wasn't the only factor at play here. Glaciation events that saw the formation of Antarctica also cooled the oceans, and temperature gradients created currents, and through these currents, the cold water cycled through the Earth and cooled both the air and the warmer water. The glaciation also caused the sea level to lower, which increased the area of dry land and the climatic volatility of the intercontinental regions. This data coincides with several meteor impacts around 34 million years ago, which are thought to have contributed to the global cooling by throwing up some ash that temporarily blocked out the sun. All of these environmental factors came to a head at the end of the Paleogene 34 million years ago, creating a strange but brief cold period that lasted for about a half a million years. This period of sudden cold is believed to have brought along the Eocene-Oligocene extinction event an extinction that took place in the later third of the Paleogene period. This extinction led to a subsequent event called the Grand Coupure, or the Great Break. It's a reference to a perceived break in the continuity of the European mammal fauna, many of which seem to have died out during the extinction event. Mammal species from Asia migrated into the emptied regions, which show up in the fossil record as a sudden explosion of Asian mammal lineages in the European fossil beds around the time period. Also during this time period, the giant birds like the forest racket and the gastornis slowly disappeared as they were outcompeted by other predators. After the extinction, the Paleogene chugged along for another 10 million years before the start of the Neogene, the next period in the Cenozoic era. This period, the Neogene, lasted about 20 million years, beginning about 23 million years ago, so it ended about 3 million years ago. Although it's relatively brief from an evolutionary perspective, a lot is known to have happened during the Neogene. It was a fertile time for plants, as hundreds of new species emerged and radiated everywhere that they could. Plants like grasses and kelps became common, each creating new environments that shaped the evolution of new species, like the snake that I mentioned earlier. For example, the kelp forests provided an environment for the emergence of otters, and the land grasses tended to push back the forest to create vast expanses of grassland that became home to a plethora of grazing species. These grazing animals belong to an order called Perissodactyla, but they're also known as the odd-toed ungulates. 
This order is composed of three lineages, the rhinos, the tapirs, and animals like horses and zebras. All of these animals find their ideal habitats in drier grasslands, where they can roam and run around these huge expanses of prairie or savanna and graze on the local vegetation. All of these groups display the traits of herbivores, like canine teeth that are small or non-existent, and broad hind teeth for grinding up leaves and grasses. The perissodactyl species were numerous and widespread at one point, existing almost everywhere except Australia and, of course, Antarctica. Over the last period of the Cenozoic era, these many lineages within the order started to die out, suffering from habitat loss and competition with other species. Today, the perissodactyls live in isolated communities scattered across the world, in pockets in East and Southern Africa, the Central Americas, and South Central Asia. The tapirs and the rhinos are particularly vulnerable, as their populations are decimated by habitat loss and poaching. Horses and donkeys, however, have secured their place in evolutionary history for the time being, having been domesticated by humans and reintroduced to virtually every region of the world. So these perissodactyls lived and thrived during the Neogene, grazing and moving about on the emergent grasslands and savannas. These biomes were more suited to the drier conditions that characterized the Neogene, and they pushed back the forests into more humid regions. This happened all over the world, back and forth, in a two-step forward, one-step back cycle, trending towards greater aridity. This trend was so strong that for a while, and by a while I mean a couple million years, but for a while there, the Mediterranean Sea had dried up. It evaporated. Right next door, the Arabian Peninsula emerged as a continental highland, draining much of the water out of the region and increasing the regional aridity tremendously. As biomes like savannas spread throughout the northern heart of Africa, the Sahara Desert began to form. A hugely important thing happened during this time period that I discussed in the episode about human evolution. Our primate ancestors lived in the forests of East Africa, but as the world dried out during the Neogene, the forests thinned and shrank back to more humid, hospitable regions. Instead of hanging out in the forests and following them as they receded back to more humid areas, the ancestors of the humans emerged from the jungles onto the hot, dry plains of the African savanna. These human ancestors were called Homo ergaster, and they would go on to produce divergent lineages called Homo erectus and Homo antecessor. The species Homo erectus would persist for about one and a half million years before going extinct, while the Homo antecessor species would undergo another divergence. This divergence produced the Homo rodensiensis and the Homo neanderthalensis, also known as the Neanderthals. So at the beginning of the Cenozoic, at the very start of the Paleogene, the world was cold and dark, about to recover from the meteor impact that caused the KT extinction. During the mid-Paleogene, the Earth had warmed significantly, and for that matter was really humid. Jungles carpeted the planet, reaching up near the poles. But then the trend reversed, and the world started to cool again. All of these factors started getting involved to cool the Earth, until by the mid to late Paleogene, we had a brief cold snap that killed a huge chunk of life on Earth. Despite the post-extinction recovery, the Earth continued to cool and became increasingly arid. Now, we're at three million years ago, at the beginning of the final period in the Cenozoic Era, a period called the Quaternary. The Quaternary is split unevenly into two smaller chunks of time. The first chunk of time is called the Pleistocene, and it composes pretty much 99.6% of the Quaternary period. When people say the Quaternary period then, they might as well be saying the Pleistocene, because it covers virtually the same exact amount of time. The second chunk of time, the much smaller one, is called the Holocene. It's only lasted for about 11 to 12,000 years, filling in that last little remaining 0.4% of the Quaternary period. For much of the early Quaternary, the cooling trend continued into a series of ice ages. In fact, the Earth was enveloped in four ice ages during this period, with each one seeing glaciers creep as far south as 40 degrees latitude. That's as far from the North Pole as New York, Madrid, Rome, and Tokyo. Meanwhile, in Africa, the increasing aridity inflamed the Sahara Desert to its current mammoth size, and also created the Namib and Kalahari Deserts. Recall how in the early Mesozoic, all the land masses of the Earth had merged into a single supercontinent called Pangaea. The coastal regions of Pangaea were near the oceans, where the water was able to regulate their climates, 
Because of this thermal regulation, the coasts never got particularly hot or cold. They were always a pretty temperate, you know, comfortable temperature. But far from the coasts, and deep inside the continental heart of Pangaea, far from any lakes or oceans, the climate could undergo huge temperature shifts. These mainland continental regions were dry, and as the air had little to no moisture, it couldn't really hold on to any heat. So during the day, these regions would get really hot. But all of this heat would dissipate during the evening to make for really cold nights. But more than that, these regions also had really cold winters and really hot summers. The temperature swings were huge, and there wasn't much life, plant or animal, that could withstand the seasonal extremes. During the Cenozoic era, the increasing planetary aridity seemed to induce this kind of temperature vulnerability onto the entire planet. Entire regions are being pushed into the extremes. Forests are pushed back by grassland, which dries up into savanna before giving way to desert. This happened not only in Africa, but in Central Asia and North America as well, where temperate rainforests in the central continental regions gave way to grasslands. Some of these grasslands remained prairie, but closer to Mexico they tended to dry up into savanna and just outright desert. In the higher latitudes, the dryness mopped up the forests and replaced them with grasslands, only for those to turn into tundra as repeated glaciation events and a cooling climate permanently froze the ground. This was a period of great geologic and meteorological change, so it should be no surprise that it was a time of great evolutionary change, too. Even though the Quaternary is a relatively short period of time, its climate has been relatively harsher and less stable than that of previous eras, which puts selective pressure on all the organisms living through it. Many of the emergent animals of this period are the archetypes that we think of when we imagine ancient human civilizations. In the northern parts of the world, woolly mammoths and mastodons appeared and radiated to walk across the frozen landscape. Elsewhere, uh, predators like dire wolves and saber-toothed tigers roamed the grasslands in search of their own food. Out there in the grasslands and savannas, hunting all these creatures for food and pelts, were the Homo sapiens, a recent emergence onto the world stage. Remember the hominid group Homo ergaster? They diverged to produce the Homo erectus and the Homo antecessor. Erectus would exist for about a million and a half years before going extinct, while antecessor would diverge into the Neanderthals and the Rodensiensis. The Neanderthals would largely move out of Africa and into Europe and northwestern Asia, while the Homo rodensiensis stayed in Africa. About 200,000 years ago, at the very tail end of the Pleistocene, a population of Homo rodensiensis undergoing speciation became Homo sapiens, evolving into the physical form of the modern human being. These Homo sapiens would spread out across the plains and forests of Africa, then move northward into Eurasia. Some groups went north into Europe, where they interbred with the Neanderthals for some time before outcompeting them into extinction. Other groups went further east into Asia, across the Arabian Peninsula, India, and Central Asia. Some groups were even able to make it across the continent to the eastern coasts of Asia, where they migrated northward into Siberia and Kamchatka. Glaciation had bound up a lot of water in the polar ice caps, so the sea level was lower and the Bering Land Bridge was exposed. This is a huge expanse of low-lying land that sits between Alaska and Russia. Today, the Bering Land Bridge is entirely submerged under the Bering Strait, but 20,000 years ago, it was a huge expanse of flat, dry land. Our human ancestors moved in bulk across this land bridge to settle North America. They moved southwards, crossing the northern continent and passing through the Panama Isthmus into South America. I want to talk about the Panama Isthmus for a moment, because it's actually really important. The Isthmus is a land bridge, a particularly narrow land bridge, which connects two giant land masses full of diverse flora and fauna. Before the Panama land bridge formed, North and South America were both isolated land masses. For millions of years, the species who lived on them had evolved and diverged from their cousin lineages who lived on the other continent. This made North and South America kind of like evolutionary petri dishes for a short time where a few native species were like the first bacteria in the petri dish, and the hundreds and thousands of their descendant species are like the huge complex bacterial colony that grows in the isolated petri dish. With that said, when the Panama Isthmus formed around 3 million years ago, it created a literal bridge between these two landmasses. The petri dishes touched, and the continents cross-contaminated the other. <laughs> 
In real terms, the land bridge provided a corridor through which mammals, reptiles, amphibians, birds, arthropods, and plants of all sorts could physically move to the other continent. This led to an event called the Great American Biotic Interchange, as huge numbers of North American species migrated into South America and vice versa. Some creatures from North America that migrated south included ungulate lineages like horses and deer, carnivoran lineages like bears, wolves, and cats, as well as smaller critters like rodents and lizards. South American creatures that migrated north came from lineages like the ground sloths and the last of the giant birds, as well as armadillo-like creatures called glyptodonts and a few species of capybara. Unfortunately for most of these migrating animals, they found themselves unable to compete in their new habitats, unable to stand up to the species who had lived there and had been adapted to those habitats for millions of years. Species that moved from North America to South America had considerably more luck, as they were moving into a warmer region with a more stable climate. Species moving north were not as lucky, as they were migrating into a harsher and more unforgiving climate than the one that they were used to. This led to a differential success between the groups who migrated north or south, where those that migrated south tended to adapt and radiate with more effectiveness than those who migrated north. Most large animals that migrated into the north ended up going extinct, outcompeted by other inhabitants or killed by the weather. But the smaller animals, like the rodents who came from South America into North America, were actually really successful. Some of these creatures, whose ancestors came up during the Great Interchange, are the armadillos and the porcupines. The rodents who migrated south were even more successful, radiating into over 80 different genera in the fertile South American wilderness. It should be noted that while the Panama Isthmus enabled the great exchange of life between the continents, it did the exact opposite for the oceans. The Panama Isthmus split an ocean in half, and you can see this in the biology of the marine life in the area. If you look at the genomes of various fish and marine plants on the west and east coasts of Central America, you'll see that they started diverging after experiencing allopatric isolation from the isthmus, when the land bridge emerged and split their aquatic biome down the middle. The later Cenozoic era was characterized by waves of glaciation events that would come and freeze the earth for thousands of years, only to melt during rewarming periods characterized by greater humidity and higher sea levels. The Pleistocene ended with the last of the glaciation events, which occurred about 11,700 years ago. In the beginning of this interval of rewarming, which is still ongoing today, Homo sapiens developed agriculture. We've figured out the basics of stone tools for something close to 3 million years, even predating the existence of Homo sapiens themselves, and our ancestors also figured out how to control fire. Much like life evolving out of the oceans, our technological development has been an accelerating process. It starts out slow, with one discovery there and one invention here, like a stone tool or getting the hang of fire. But over time, this adds up, and the momentum of our technology builds. We invent more stuff, more sophisticated tools, and with those tools, we create even more tools. We create even more sophisticated machines and technology, and this just builds on itself and compounds and compounds and compounds, just forever. This has been going on for about 10,000 years since we developed agriculture, and in the blink of a geologic eye, those savanna-dwelling proto-humans went from tinkering with rocks and fire to communicating instantaneously across the planet and sending spaceships to the moon. All of our complex society, all of our technology, all of our ways of life, literally everything that isn't a part of the genetic heritage, this was all developed in the last 10,000 years of human existence. All right, everyone, so that's about it. That's the story of life on Earth. I might have left out a few details here and there, but if I were to include everything, like as many extinct species and migration routes and extinction events and glaciation events and everything else that happened during Earth's history, this series would end up being 10,000 years long. It would be horrible to listen to. You know, I had to keep it short. So I hope you enjoyed what you got. This series was particularly fun for me to research and write, and I hope you liked listening to it as well. Next episode, I'm going to wrap up this series of the evolutionary history of life on Earth with a more in-depth look at the Holocene, and I'll be exploring the ecology and biology of the world of ancient man. If that sounds interesting, be sure to check it out. And as always, thanks for listening. Would you like to support the Biologic Podcast? It's super easy. When you open a new episode, press the like button or share it with your friends. 
If you aren't subscribed, you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week. You can also peruse our official store, which has a ton of cool stuff like hand-designed t-shirts, hoodies, and stickers. All the links you need are in the description section below. Peace.